This is the Statue of Liberty. Tonight, the illusion of the century. David Copperfield will attempt to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. The wealth, strength, and confidence of our country has dissipated over the horizon. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. For many decades, we've enriched foreign industry at the expense of American industry, subsidize the armies of other countries while allowing for the very sad depletion of our military. We've defended other nations' borders while refusing to defend our own. But that is the past. And now we are looking only to the future. We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America. It's time to put away the harsh rhetoric lower the temperature, see each other again, listen to each other again. Americans have called upon us to marshal the forces of decency, the forces of fairness, to marshal the forces of science, and the forces of hope in the great battles of our time, the battle to control the virus, the battle to build prosperity, the battle to secure your family's health care, the battle to achieve racial justice and root out systemic racism in this country. And the battle to save our planet by getting climate under control. The battle to restore decency, defend democracy, and give everybody in this country a fair shot. That's all they're asking for, a fair shot. Let this grim era of demonization in America, begin to end here and now. Tonight, the whole world is watching America. And I believe at our best, America is a beacon for the globe. We will lead not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson. I'm the Ottawa Bureau Chief for Global News and host of the West Block. And it is my pleasure to be able to bring to you a very important and relevant panel in the wake of the United States election. America in the world, looking at its role after 2020, after four years of asking what a world without America looks like, we're now asking what does the return of America to the global stage mean? How does it play out? What does it mean for strategic relationship and international norms? Joining us to talk about this, we have an expert panel. Please welcome uh, Rob Bauer, who is Chief of the Defence Staff for the Netherlands Armed Forces, Mark Green, Executive Director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, and Ola Stefanishnaya, who is the Deputy Prime Minister for Ukraine. I would invite our panelists to begin by making some opening comments. Ola, I'd like to start with you, certainly for Ukraine, having the role of America in terms of deterring Russia so important. What do you think the world has after 2020 as we look at a world with America? 
Thank you so much, Madam Stevenson. It's a great pleasure to uh, participate in this uh, fabulous discussions and especially to cover the topic which is really on the top of the agenda in the whole world. And uh, Ukraine uh, is very inspired with the uh, with the new political period la uh, launched in the in the United States with the new elect uh, elections which were just held and the inauguration which will take place on the 20s of. Uh, of January, and uh, definitely we're looking for this new momentum uh, presented by these new opportunities, but not only for Ukraine's bilateral relations, but uh, to the whole transatlantic unity and uh, to reinforcement of the democracy around the world, which Ukraine has the primary interest in as a country fighting against Russian aggression on its territory on a daily basis and standing for the democratic values. And today in Ukraine, particularly, we have the Day of the Dignity and Freedom, which symbolized the days uh, where Ukrainian people were fighting for democracy and freedoms. And basically, uh, it's very important that this uh, transformation and this new political period with the new uh, Biden administration is launching in particular moment when NATO forms the new 10 year strategy. And we're now in the middle of this process. And I'm sure that following the, the last statements, then this uh, continued policy of uh, Biden and in his future administration, we see that uh, America is seen as a, uh, as a reinforced global player and the player which would have a significant role in the new transformations of the NATO and addressing mm -hmm. the global challenges and in particular challenges related to security and hybrid threats. And Ukraine has been a, a, a very constant, persistent and very significant ally to NATO and all the free world in terms of fighting against hybrid threats, ensuring the Black Sea security and uh, this is where we stand and this is what we see and we were willing to see in the new uh, global, as a new global role America could play uh, in the transatlantic security. And, uh, uh, and it's very important that uh, Ukraine is not, it would not be a new profile for the new administration. There is a clear understanding uh, about Ukraine's commitment, Ukraine's situation, and we're really seeking for the new impetus to be given in terms of the a stronger U.S. involvement in the Donbas peace process, but also uh, we are sure that the reforms agenda we're paving the way towards on a daily basis brings us the ability to be more vocal about the more clear visions of Ukraine NATO affairs, Ukraine's EU affairs. We would be um, happy to hear a stronger commitment to the NATO open door policy and its reinforcement over the NATO summit. And uh, uh, we want to see a very uh, strong and uh, clear strategy about all the Black Sea region, and we're pose, uh, posing ourselves as a country who can be the regional leader in terms of the development of the Black Sea strategy, and uh, uh, which is definitely impossible without Ukraine. And uh, here, where allies, US uh, and uh, Ukraine, shall have the, the unified and one strategy, and. Uh, uh, the strategy would have the one common goal to strengthen the whole sound, southeastern flank of NATO by the whole region. And uh, uh, it's, very, it's very important that uh, uh, we're facing these challenges and this very serious political period uh, in the situation where Russia becomes and continues to be a major threat over Ukraine's democracy and sovereignty, but also when it comes to the sovereignty and uh, preserving the democratic values all over the region. And um, in this uh, particular context, uh, Ukraine's cooperation with allies and uh, NATO in the area, as I've said, of the Black Sea plays a very significant role, which is, brings it not only about military cooperation, but also as the, less, let's say, the last fight for, for the uh, democratic development of the whole region. We're very happy to uh, to uh, mark uh, the recent uh, elections also in Moldova uh, uh, of Maya Sandu, uh, and she became a president, which shows that there are at least two countries in the whole Eastern Europe region which, which preserving the democracy and the rule of law and the uh, free world values. And this policy should be unified and strengthened with our common uh, common uh, vision of the both NATO development, but also the development of uh, the region. 
So, uh, so we remain committed to the agenda and we really uh, want to put more focus also on uh, non-military threats when it comes to fighting and hybrid threats and building stronger resilience over these threats. Ukraine remains a pioneer in the spheres and uh, I'm sure that together with our new allies, we would build on this experience and uh, bring it to a stronger allies. And um, uh, to this uh, to this extent, I would be happy to uh, re-engage with uh, with the new administration after the January this year, and we would be happy to uh, to uh, form the list of the common priorities, among which, as as you might know, the Nord Stream two, where the U.S. Senate has uh, reinforced the sanctions, but this remains as a major threat, and I'm sure that. Uh, under the new administration, this new threats and new challenges will remain uh, remain addressed in a very strong position. So, um, so Ukraine role is very uh, Ukraine's role as the uh, role of the regional leader remains very strong, and we are committed to make it even stronger. So, uh, you uh, you must be aware that we're going over the very turbulent periods of transformations inside of our country, but this doesn't mean that Ukraine uh, uh, cannot be a global player, a player. And every day we strive and fight for that. And I'm sure that uh, this particular historical moment, uh, when the new administration com comes to the office, would strengthen both our bilateral relations, but mostly the transatlantic unity over the continent. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that. We appreciate it. I want to turn it over to Rob now. Rob, the military perspective here. I mean, America is a global military superpower, but under the Trump presidency, we heard questions about whether or not uh, NATO would continue as we know it, a vow to pull out of Afghanistan, and a lot of questions about military strikes, including the one that killed General Soleimani. So what is your view for your opening statement of what the world looks like after 2020 with America? Mercedes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think this is the first major international gathering of security and defense officials uh, since the United States presidential elections on November the 3rd. My hope uh, is that the United States will show more stability in its foreign and defense policy. And I choose the word stability on purpose and not the word predictability. Because for me, predictability carries a sense of taking things for granted. And that is exactly what we should not be doing. If there's one thing we can all take away from the Trump administration is that it, for too long, we have taken the United States leadership in the world for granted. We have allowed the US umbrella to shield us from the storm and we have not put enough precautions in place ourselves. In many ways, the Trump administration has been a rude awakening. Moving forward, we should make sure we can stand on our own two feet and take responsibility for our own freedom and security. All over the world, countries are ramping up their defense budgets. In 2019, Global military expenditure was 7.2% higher than it was in 2010. For the first time, two Asian countries were among the top three, with China and India spending an estimated 261 billion, up 5.1% for China, and 71.1 billion, up 6.8%, respectively. In Europe, Germany's military spending rose by 10% in 2019 to 49.3 billion, the highest since 1993. And Sweden and the UK will both uh, um, raise their military spending by about 40% in the next five years. But all in all, European defense uh, expenditure and cooperation leaves a lot to be desired. In 2019, spending targets of the 2% GDP were fulfilled by only eight European NATO members. And my nation, the Netherlands, was not one of them. Meetings of the European Union Military Committee remain unclassified, and EU foreign policy is hampered by conflicting views amongst member states in the search for consensus. This worries me. 
because strong European defense benefits not only Europe itself, but also the transatlantic alliance as a whole. A strong Europe is a strong NATO and vice versa. As chief of defense of a country that is a founding member of the United Nations, NATO and the European Union, I'm a firm believer in multinational alliances, multilateral organizations, and very important, a rule-based order. President-elect Joe Biden has always been a strong supporter of NATO and the transatlantic relationship. He believes that the example of US power must be matched by the power of the example the US sets. He understands that we need our collective strength to deal with the many, many challenges we face, including a more assertive Russia, international terrorism, cyber and missile threats, and a shift in the global balance of power with the rise of China. We can only be secure and successful if we face these challenges together. During the Trump administration, we have sometimes been surprised by announcements on Twitter that US troops are ret retreating. I'm hopeful that we can leave these surprises behind us. And as I said before, I'm looking forward to more stability in US foreign policy. But there is one thing I believe will not change under the next administration. And that is the valid claim of the United States that other countries must do their fair share without burden sharing international alliances lose their solidarity and eventually their credibility and power. All in all, over the next few years, we may expect a more nuanced tone from the US and more continuity in policy. We can certainly rejoice in that, but that does not mean we can lean back and let the US do our dirty work for them. We must all do our fair share. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. Uh, I'd like to go now to Mark. Mark, you are the American on the panel. Uh, and a lot of folks are wondering what's going on inside America's head right now. I know this administration is just getting started, but your opening thoughts on where you see America taking its place in the world and whether we're going to see a return to the Obama days or even pre-Obama days of even more engagement or uh, if that ship really has sailed. Well, uh, first, thanks, Mercedes. I'm honored to be on this panel and, of course, uh, honored to be part of the Halifax International Security Forum. So a couple of thoughts. In some ways, uh, I think the video that we had to introduce the panel was particularly apt. So just let you in on a little bit of a secret. When David Copperfield per first pulled down that curtain, the Statue of Liberty didn't really go away. It was an illusion. And then when he pulled it back up and put it down the second time, it didn't magically appear. So I, I think it's important to understand that America's engagement in the world has been continuing. Um, you know, it is true that Americans are oftentimes uh, weary of alliances and the burdens that we all see and the costs that go with that. We tend to be awakened as to the importance of alliances when great challenges arise. We certainly did around 9-11. I think we are these days with COVID, the rise of great power competition. I think it is reminding us of just how important these relationships are. But I guess getting to your question, something very important to think through, this won't be merely a return to four years ago. The world has changed in four years. Iran is not where it was. China is not where it was. We have, of course, the challenges presented by COVID and the economic fallout from that. And I would add another challenge to it that I, I don't think we should underestimate. And that's the problem of historic levels of human displacement. We have nearly 80 million people displaced in the world right now, every corner of the globe, usually from conflict and tyranny that they're fleeing. And all these present enormous challenges. So, uh, you know, it is an illusion that America has gone away. But I do think, as uh, we heard from the Admiral, this is a moment for all of us to reaffirm our alliances, realize the challenges aren't the same necessarily as they were four years ago. And so our alliances have to adapt to take them on. So I'm an optimist. I believe that American leaders.
leadership is going to come back as strong as ever. But I also believe that uh, we need to be open-eyed as to the challenges we face, uh, the costs that are involved, and what we all can do together. Thanks, Mark. I think that gives uh, hope to some folks out there watching. And I just want to apologize to you, Rob, for calling you general. I do know you are an admiral, and that is <laughs> a big no-no. Before we get any further into questions, though, we want to stop and take a moment to watch a video. The forum had the opportunity to ask some of the participants and global leaders about what they expect the world to look like after 2020 with the return of America and how that will affect the international order. Take a look at this. I think the uh, the state of the world, the global community, rules-based community that we grew up with, you and I, uh, during the Cold War and in a period afterwards, has really taken a terrible beating because of the difficulties of the disease and the economic challenges, but also because the uh, the U.S. really walked away from many of its traditional leadership roles in the world. Um, and so, you know, we have, I think, 62 days left in this administration, and, and I won't purport to speak for the Biden administration, but I know him uh, well, and I know many of, uh, we, we have an embarrassment of riches with respect to the human talent around him. Uh, and I know that first and foremost, uh, if you listen closely to his inaugural address, the people of the world will have a very good feel for what he, he and his administration, along with Kamala Harris, Will stand for in the world. It's, I think, first and foremost, you hear our recommitment to human rights. Turkey and the United States have uh, deep rooted and the uh, long standing strategic relations. We have been steadfast uh, allies for almost the uh, 70 years, as you know. We have, of course, in the ups and downs in these in the relations, as, the, as in the other countries, uh, uh, and the uh, the occasional uh, sharp differences of opinion, but let's not forget that we have a long tradition of cooperation and overcoming challenges through dialogue between the two countries. In Korea, for instance, Somalia, the Balkans, Afghanistan, and in the other the geographies worldwide, we have uh, worked very closely together, shoulder to shoulder. And uh, much of our daily successful cooperation on a wide and the common agenda uh, goes unnoticed uh, while differences are sometimes highlighted, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes uh, perceptions can overshadow reality, causing uh, misperceptions. Uh, so we must avoid this. This is a very important uh, issue. Our militaries, for instance, uh, conduct the exercises at air, land, and sea in addition to the operations and the common activities in any corner of the world. The big challenges of the 21st century don't know borders. Climate change doesn't know borders. Um, a virus or a pandemic doesn't know borders, as is obviously clear. The global refugee crisis, where tens of millions of people at any point in time might be moving here or there because of civil war, instability, hunger, disease, poor government, climate change, that doesn't know borders. So. I think the um, a consequence coming out of this, I hope in, in the United States, will be a realization that we don't need to step back from alliances, international organizations. We may need to reconceive them. We may need to reform them. But uh, I think the need for them has been made even more palpable by this particular challenge. And the good news is, I, you know, President-elect Biden, that's in his DNA as a former chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I think he views the power of American alliances as maybe the most important part of the power that we have. I want to go to you first, Rob, to talk about those alliances because you had mentioned NATO, so had Olha. Uh, I don't think that we thought we were alive in a time where we would have to question whether or not NATO would continue to exist as an institution, uh, whether the United States, the most powerful, influential, and, and the country with the most money in that alliance would potentially pull out of it. Uh, announcements, as you pointed out, of troops being pulled out of a country over Twitter with just weeks notice. It all created a tremendous amount of instability in the international system. Can the United States just step back into its previous role? Or do you think that the global system has changed and you've seen rivals come into those vacuums to compensate? And some of these international institutions have simply learned to work without the United States or become less relevant? 
I can't speak for everything, uh, Mercedes, but for NATO, it will not be an issue. There's no one who can step actually into the uh, vacuum if there has been any uh, when the U.S. Uh, uh, might leave. I don't think um, uh, it, it is in the interest of the United States to leave NATO. Uh, I think, uh, it, but that's my personal view, that President Trump has used leaving NATO as an argument to push everyone to the to the edge and make sure everybody understood that um, living up to your promises is actually something that can lead to a problem if you're not doing that. So I think that was the main reason why he used that argument. But I don't think the United States as a nation would consider leaving NATO. Uh, it was the uh, former chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, who actually said to President Trump, and he told me so, that, uh, uh, Mr. President, you would love to have had a NATO in Africa. You would love to have had a NATO in Asia or in South America. Uh, and of course, that is not the case. So with all the disadvantages of NATO, the good news is there is a political and military platform to uh, look at the different problems that are uh, uh, multiple and to solve these problems. And I think um, that uh, some of the issues that were uh, raised in the last couple of uh, months in, in Europe, for example, the, the issue between Turkey and Greece is uh, partly solved because they were both, they are both part of NATO. And that helped tremendously to bring them back to the table to make sure they, they remain talking and not um, deepen the conflict. So I think um, it is in the interest of all of us. But as I said in my earlier statement, I think we have to live up to our promises. And that is a very important thing. I don't think that will change with the new administration. The tone might change, but the content of the message will remain the same. So uh, I don't think uh, there is a there is a vacuum there because there no one no one else can fill that vacuum if if if, uh, if the United if the United States would leave. Uh, Ola, you are, of course, Ukrainian, and it has been such a complex relationship with Ukraine and America, uh, not only in recent years, but it has become much, much more complex, many more intricacies, in particular with the allegations of uh, Russian interference in the American election, obviously Russian interference in the Ukrainian elections, and then Iran shooting down the Ukrainian airlines plane, which, of course, had a significant number of Canadians on it, too. If you could sit down with President-elect Biden and ask him for what you think America needs to do with its foreign policy, what would be the top three things you would ask him for? So much, and um, uh, indeed, the top. Speaking about the top three things is uh, just also continuing what uh, uh, was already said that uh, we should make uh, alliance uh, stronger. And uh, uh, and uh, U.S. has a particular role in that. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, U.S. input into the new NATO strategy and the vision for development of the whole transatlantic security. Uh, then uh, I would be happy to see a stronger military cooperation between Ukraine and uh, U.S., including uh, including uh, involvement into the peaceful resolution of the Donbas. Uh, conflict, but also in terms of military cooperation, but also in terms of strategic investments and uh, and development. And the the third issue, which is of top importance uh, for the United States, but but the whole free world, is the uh, Black Sea security and the strategy for the Black Sea and the increased military presence in the Black Sea, which remains as a key issue, and which remains fully unaddressed both by NATO, but by the whole uh, uh, international community. So this would be the three things to uh, to address. And of course, when we're talking about the stronger allies, it is impossible to have the stronger allies with uh, without its allies. So of course, Ukraine would uh, like to see a stronger perspective for its membership in the NATO, given the fact that we're continuously showing uh, uh, by our reforms, our commitment and capability of our military forces. So this cooperation could be increased and Ukraine's granting a map would be 
a good and a very strong signal for the transformation of the whole region and thus bringing more security and resilience towards the whole transatlantic security. So one of the key points also would be about broader engagement of the US into the uh, uh, bigger security all over the world. Mark, one of the big questions is what the relationship will look like with adversaries like Iran and China. What are you expecting on that? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why these alliances are so important. As you might imagine, from an institute bearing the name of John McCain, we are enthusiastic supporters of American engagement, American leadership, and the importance of alliances. But as the other panelists have suggested, these alliances need to be updated. They need to be updated because the challenges uh, have been updated. We see a resurgent uh, Russia uh, using what some have termed sharp power, power that it intends to pierce democracy and information systems, but you're pointing to China. And, and China, I, I think the key to it for Americans is understanding that this is great power competition not merely a bilateral poke each other in the eye, which of course may be satisfying politically to some, but understanding that this is a competition taking place in third markets, in Africa, in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and so many places. And we all need to work together to understand how we strengthen a rules-based system, how we project values, uh, as uh, Liam Fox said a couple of days ago, this is a contest of ideas and ideals and a test of resolve. All of these mean that we need to be working closely together, making sure that each member's interests are served and understanding the nature of these challenges and what we can each bring to the table to take them on. Not one of the challenges that you mentioned or that Senator, Senator Kane referred to, not a single one of them can be addressed by any country alone, whether it be America as a superpower or any one or two or three members. This is something that only gets addressed effectively if we are constantly working together, testing into each country's capacities and making sure that we understand this isn't four years ago, this is a new era requiring new solutions, new tactics. Uh, Mark, just to follow up on something you said there about the relationship with China, obviously it was very confrontational uh, under Donald Trump. This is a particularly sensitive spot for a lot of Five Eyes countries, uh, in particular Canada and others who have had citizens um, detained, basically taken hostage by China under this new wolf warrior diplomacy. And there's always been a question, I know certainly in Canadians' minds, about sort of how sincerely the Trump administration was trying to free Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. We still have the request for extradition of Meng Wanzhou, Huawei CFO, who is here in Canada. Australia is taking a much tougher stance against China, and they've suffered cyber attacks. Uh, and a lot of countries are expecting them to suffer some pretty significant economic consequences as China starts to reduce trade. A country like Canada uh, would be much more vulnerable to that. The United States has a huge market with China and a lot more influence. So what do you think America will be able to do there uh, to try to draw together the Five Eyes and other European and, and Western and Democratic allies in standing up to China? Well, you, you brought in a number of important points here. So first off, this isn't an old Cold War updated to a new model, right? Uh, unlike uh, Russia, the integration uh, really with all of us in our economies is far greater than it was in the old U.S.-Soviet days. And we have to recognize that that creates more complex challenges. Uh, but I, I think President Trump's great contribution to these times is really awakening America to the challenge that, challenges that we see and the failure of the experiment. The experiment being we all believed that if China was brought in on a, on a trade basis into a more rule, rules-based system, that they would modernize, they would become more values-oriented, and they would become more Western economy-like, and of course that has failed. Instead, this is a very serious battle of ideas, and it really is a test as to see whose value system, those represented by all attending today, or a more authoritarian model, which are going to hold. So I think the great awakening that we've seen in the last few years is really the first step towards taking these challenges on. There's a greater level of, uh, I think, cooperation, and in particularly on the technology front, I, I think people understand like never before 
the technology challenges that we see. So again, to me, those are the first steps, the first key steps in really getting this challenge under control and moving forward. So again, I remain optimistic because of the strength of the NATO alliance and those represented here today. Challenges are difficult, they're more complicated than we've seen before, but working together, I have every confidence that we'll see progress in coming years. Rob, I know that you are becoming the chairman of the NATO Military Committee, I believe, in summer of, of 2021, not all that far off, which means it's going to be your job to try to manage all of these different military commitments and the priorities for NATO. Do you think that the rules of the international system have changed such uh, that, that America can come in and reset them? Because some argue that it was largely that abdication of, of leadership and responsibility that allowed for some of the rules-based system to be weakened. Uh, and I know you've talked about sort of refreshing these institutions, but how do you go about doing that when the whole paradigm on which this was built now has fractures in it? Uh, Mercy, I think um, that the uh, it is not just a, a battle of ideas, um, uh, because as Mark as Mark says, because I think what we also see is that I think in the last two two years there's more nations turning from a democracy to an auto autocracy um, for reasons not necessarily known to me, but. Um, one could make the conclusion that there is uh, a benefit in doing that. So the benefit in general seen to become a democracy and that being the better of all systems, not necessarily, I'm not saying that I think that, but not necessarily is the case all over the world. So there is an alternative, so to say. And I think China is one of the represents uh, of, uh, re is representing that particular uh, option uh, and it has a different stance when it comes to approaching the United States and it is not necessarily responding to the normal mechanisms um, that are used in international uh, cooperation in international affairs uh, because it basically says uh, I'm not playing along your rules and it has become economically uh, so big and more and more militarily so big that it is something to reckon to 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 uh, to look at and to take into consideration so i think for um europe and for canada uh, we have to understand that the us is changing its attention from the region where i live in and where you all live in in, in terms of the united states and canada to asia for a reason because they have to respond to this increasing power that China is becoming. And because they have a single set of forces as well, it's much bigger than the, than the force of the Nellis, but it's still a single set of forces. So they have to uh, move away from Europe. And therefore, the logical uh, conclusion is you take care of your own because you have the money, you have basically all the technology, so do it. And so we can go and do our business somewhere else where it is needed. So I don't think this is a problem of the institution. I think this is a problem of um, pragmatism. This is this is this is the result of world power shifting. Ola, what is at stake here in terms of what kind of role the United States decides to take globally, and and what it means for the global order? Uh, I, I would really support uh, many things which were uh, already said, and indeed this is something our president also reiterates very often on, that basically we're living in a world with uh, little of borders actually left. Uh, and uh, in, in the times of globalization, it's extremely important to build this unity and preserve the values and uh, to, to build the common ground for transformation development. And uh, uh, I would particular, uh, particularly um, be interested in seeing uh, NATO stronger role, also NATO and allies and US stronger low, uh, role in the non-military transformations and addressing global challenges, for example, like climate change. And uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm uh, I'm inspired to to uh, to see uh, United States uh, 
um, stronger input into global efforts towards climate change and uh, uh, and green trans green transformations of uh, economies. While it's not a military issue and it's not a military of security, but also it's also the but it is the issue of the human rights. It's the issue of the uh, of the security of each and every person. So, uh, so this challenge is to be addressed also together with the uh, with the uh, discussions we were talking and uh, coming back to what I've also said is the uh, bringing more stability and uh, uh, predictability towards uh, regions uh, to, towards Black Sea region would be the crucial uh, crucial uh, role of the United States you, it can play over the stability of the whole continent. So. Uh, addressing climate climate challenges, uh, bringing more strategic view over the security in the Black Sea, and uh, uh, bringing back U.S. Uh, as a as a global player towards the uh, international uh, community. Thanks, Ola. Uh, you know, Mark, I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you uh, as our American guest on this panel that I think a lot of folks out there are wondering about. Uh, the first one I would ask is what happens in terms of America's ability to lead if President Trump continues to refuse to acknowledge the election results and concede defeat? Well, look, uh, we'll get this right. Uh, it may take a little bit of time, but we're getting there. We'll get this right. And the great news is with a democracy is that when we do, as we move forward, it's with a, re a renewal of our mandate for our leaders. And so I think the challenges that we're talking about, these are challenges people should feel confident that we'll be taking on. Uh, again, uh, I think what we've seen coming out of these elections is certainly a, a renewal of democracy. It's a messy, difficult debate at times. On the other hand, even in the era of COVID, we've seen record turnout. We've seen 150 million people turn out to vote in sometimes challenging circumstances. So uh, I think as we move forward, is it is with a renewed mandate. And I, I think a renewed mandate for American leadership. And when it comes to American leadership, of course, it's, it's not just about who the president is. It's also about Congress and it's about the Senate. Do you expect that there's going to be bipartisan support for a return of America to the global stage? Well, sure. But again, you know, I, I want to be careful because the world is not where it was four years ago. And it's very important that we realize that China's in a different place. Iran is in a different place. The fallout from COVID. So I think you'll see a renewal of alliances, but those alliances need to be updated. They need to change as the world has changed. But I think there is bipartisan consensus for increased American engagement, because again, all these challenges we're talking about, including COVID-19, none of them can be addressed by America alone or any one of the members alone. Rob, certainly none of this can be addressed by any country alone. How do you see the global system transforming in the next year or two as America tries to move back into that role and that leadership? What does American leadership look like now on the global stage? What would you like to see? Well, as I said uh, in, my, uh, in my statement, I think all uh, nations are looking at the United States and hoping that there will be uh, more stability in uh, in uh, in its policy uh, with regard to security and and foreign policy. So I think that is one of the things that would be a, a good thing. Uh, so there have been some decisions fairly recently that were taken um, without con consultation uh, in a, uh, for example, in an operation that is being led by a larger organization than the U.S. alone. And so therefore, um, uh, when it comes to re the, the difference in 2021 uh, with a new administration, I think that is the, the, the thing people and organizations are looking forward to, to have the, uh, the normal sort of debate and the normal uh, discussion amongst how to change things and then change it in that, in that order. And um, so, so I think that is, an, that is a very important uh, thing because um, I think everyone is longing for the U.S. to take that role in that in that particular way. Uh, so uh, I don't think once it happens that people will be uh, that will that that it will change anything. Because I think in general, 
people will be uh, happy, very happy if the U.S. is is retaking that particular role, and that's in that way. We just have a few seconds left, but Ola, what will it mean for Ukraine if America doesn't get this right? Well, I'm sure that there is no chance for that. I'm sure that there is uh, no what, chance for that. <laughs> I'll take that. Well, does that mean that the potential serious national security dangers for Ukraine? What, what does that mean for your people? Uh, well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure, and as I've said already, that uh, the particular uh, good news for Ukraine uh, is that the Ukrainian file, as well as the region, regional file, is not a new file for the uh, President-elect Biden and his administration. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine's uh, support to uh, support of the United States towards Ukraine uh, has been very strong and unwavering for uh, all the periods and uh, for all the times and including the uh, the military support and uh, uh, both uh, bipartisan support has been very strong uh, of Ukraine. I'm not expecting any changes in that for so there's only one way I can see uh, as a respect of strengthening our relations and building on the experiences both of us, I mean, Ukraine and U.S. already have. So these challenges are to be addressed only together and uh, uh, with Ukraine as a global player on the uh, on this continent. Okay, last question to you, Mark. Is America a reliable ally after 2020? Absolutely, uh, because we're bound together by ideals and ideas. More importantly, I think there's a recognition in America that we simply can't take these challenges on alone. It's in our interest for our alliances to be stronger and more vibrant than ever. Uh, challenges have changed, but that doesn't change the importance of American engagement and working closely with our allies. Well, thank you so much, Rob, Ola, and Mark. A fascinating discussion, very different perspectives. I think that we will all be watching closely to see how America's role and return to the global stage unfold, the challenges ahead, and certainly the work that democracies have to do together. With that, we're going to wrap up this panel and head back to our friends in Washington, D.C., where I know Robin is waiting for us. Robin, back to you. Mercedes, thank you so much. That was a terrific panel. Um, Thank well, you. Thank you for having us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes another year of Halifax International Security Forum. Um, it, it's the 12th year. Um, it's been an unusual year. I'm joined here in the studio in Washington, D.C. Uh, by Peter Van Praag, the president of Halifax International Security Forum of HFX. Um, and Peter, you know, I've been with you um, uh, in different incarnations since the very beginning. I think it's fair to say that every year we do take a look back uh, at the conference and try and learn something. Um, I wonder what you think, uh, I guess this is just seconds after we've concluded, but uh, what are your first thoughts about what we've learned this year? Well, Robin, thanks very much. I wanna thank you uh, for hosting us through the weekend. Um, one of the things I've learned this year is that uh, you're ready for broadcast television. <laughs> So uh, congratulations, you did a great job. Um, we've also learned, frankly, as an organization, how to put on a TV show. Um, and as I've said to my board of directors, God willing, uh, we won't have to do it again. Um, and that would, together we'll be uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia next year. But there are some more profound things uh, to think about. Um, you know, if we were meeting 20 years ago, um, we wouldn't have predicted 9-11. And um, 12 years ago, hardly anybody predicted the economic crisis of 2008 and the recession that came. Um, we were among those, but very few people uh, could see the rise of populism and what it would mean for the world, including the United States. And just this past year, nobody predicted what 2020 was going to look like. So one of the most important things is to use our imaginations um, expect the unexpected. Um, the good news, I believe, and I think we heard it throughout the weekend, is that um, there is going to be more consistent, more predictable, and frankly better American leadership coming to the United States and coming to the world 
um, and I think that is fundamental. We've, talk, we've talked a lot about the importance of democracies working together, um, but let there be no mistake, um, uh, effective democracies working together will work best with strong American leadership, and I think we heard that throughout the weekend. So there's reasons to be optimistic. I think we've got to get through uh, the pandemic, um, but I think there's, um, there's reasons to be optimistic about the world to come. I do, I do want to mention as well, we heard a lot about China. I'm grateful to you and to the organization for putting together uh, the China Handbook, China versus Democracy, the Greatest Game. Um, I do think that what we heard throughout the weekend from NATO and, and uh, from others, uh, Americans and others from around the world, is that there is really um, an understanding that the democracies have to come together to meet the challenge that is coming from a rising China. I think that's the case, and, and it's it certainly, we, we heard Secretary General of NATO, yep. Jens Stoltenberg, we've had um, uh, Senators, Senator Chris Kuhn, Senator Tim Kaine, uh, we've had a whole range of people from around the world discussing that, and I think everybody, it, it's as if 2020, um, it was certainly the year of COVID-19, it was also the year which kind of inaugurated a paradigm shift uh, in the world's approach to China, and, uh, and I hope we've done our bit, and we will continue to do our bit um, to, to prepare us for, for this challenge. I think that's right. Robin, I think that's right. There's, look, there, there, there's plenty of work to do, and um, all of us have to do our part. Well, Peter, um, as I said, uh, this is uh, this is the end of, uh, of of HFX 2020. Have you got any final words? Uh, Robin, thanks again. Um, I want to thank uh, a number of people. I want to thank you. I want to thank my whole team. I want to thank our board of directors, uh, led by Janice Stein. Um, but uh, we've got a very strong board: Cindy McCain, Amit Tachildiz. Uh, Major General Tammy Harris, Ambassador Mark Lippert, and Dr. Luis Rubio. I'm very grateful to all of them. And uh, just a final thanks to uh, the folks who have given us financial support. Um, I want to thank our media partners, Politico, Foreign Affairs, but um, Club HFX, uh, which is Boeing, uh, Chalik Holdings, OYAK, and ATCO. Um, and uh, I want to thank NATO, and I want to thank Canada. Uh, Canada gives us a great deal of support, both from ACOA, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, um, and uh, the Department of National Defense. And I'm very grateful to Minister Sajjan uh, for everything he's done uh, to make sure that Halifax International Security Forum stays strong. I want to thank all of our viewers, all of our participants, and everybody around the world who understands how important it is for democracies to come together to make the world a better place. Next year, we will be in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in person, and we're looking forward to that as well.